All right, so today, uh, research, methods of research in psychopharmacology. Again, I don't <coughs> want you to, you're not going to be an expert in these methods, right? Because we're going to go through like a whole host of methods in just, you know, a couple hours, right? So I don't expect you to be fully versed in everything, but uh, I do expect you to have a basic idea of things. This will help you moving forward as we read about and you try to learn about these things on your own. And you talk about these different uh, different uh, drugs and so forth that you're going to present later in the semester. Knowing a little bit about the methods is going to be helpful. Uh, there are always limitations to the methods, right? So there are sort of two broad types of research you can do. You can do human research or you can do animal research, right? Uh, there are, are limitations and ethical concerns on both of those ends, right? Uh, obviously, a rat is not a human. In case anybody didn't know that, uh, you can look that up. It's on Wikipedia, I'm certain. Uh, but there are certain things you can't do in people, right? Like if I want to say, hey, what are the effects of cocaine? I can't just give all of you cocaine, right? That just doesn't seem ethical for some reason, right? Well, you can't just randomly give people cocaine. So I have to give rats cocaine, see what they do. And then I have to sort of guess, well, if that's what a rat did on cocaine, what do I think a person would do, right? And you kind of go through that kind of process. But we'll talk about those details in this one, too. All right. Again, if you want to understand how your brain works, you got to have uh, discipline, or you know, lots of disciplines chip in on this. Here's like a chunk of those. Okay. Again, I don't expect you to be experts in any of these at this point in your life. Uh, you might eventually be experts in, in one of those. All right. For us, we're thinking about behavior, mood, and cognitive function. Right. These are the things that we're going to measure as outcomes. Do you feel better? Are you alleviating some problem? Right. If we're trying to figure out. Um, if this drug uh, helps with depression, do you feel better? Uh, are you more active? Right? Are you better able to concentrate? Right? Some folks might be on medications to treat attentional issues. Right? Um, that's fine. If you're on those, what's that cognitive function? Are you improving your uh, your attention? Right? In all of these cases, we're, well, not in all the cases. In an ideal situation, right, we would have a placebo control set of subjects, right? A set of subjects that we're not going to give the drug to, but we're not going to let them know they're not getting the drug, right? Because we talked about that placebo effect before, right? And if we tell you, well, you're not getting the drug, you're definitely not going to feel a benefit. If we tell you you may or may not get the drug, then we're, we're kind of evening the odds, right? And hopefully, the idea here is to sort of average out that placebo effect so that the folks who are in the control group and the folks who are in the um, experimental group sort of have equal expectations about whether or not they're getting the drug, right? And so on average, each person is going to have the same expectation of benefit. And so any placebo effect is going to be the same across groups. Now, that's awesome for humans. We also want to take this into, into account when we think about um, animal research as well, right? Okay. How many of you are perfect? Great, that's what I thought. Um, how many of you are totally unbiased? Nobody, right? Uh, that's life. So if I tell you, hey, here is a rat, and this rat is super smart, okay? You're going to put that rat in a maze. What's going to happen when you time that rat? Be a little, you're expecting it, right? That's going to be a little faster. So maybe you're a little faster on the, on the, on the end time, right? So that rat's going to be a little faster. And if I say, hey, here's a stupid rat. You stick it in that box. You know, you're sitting around, you're just waiting. And I'll say, oh, oh, the rat finished, right? And so the times might be different. Even in an animal experiment, we want to make sure that everything is even, right? And this is why we'll typically do what's called a double blind, right? So not only will the participants not know whether those are rats or humans, whether or not they're getting the drug, but the person analyzing that data, the person running that experiment is not going to know if that uh, human or that animal received the drug or not, right? So they don't know. So all we're going to do is we're going to measure that behavior because behavior is typically subjective, right? Uh, so we're looking at, at very subjective things here. and We want to try to remove as much uh, subjectivity as possible. Okay? And we do that with this double-blind process. Somebody has to know 
when it comes down to it, right? Which group you were in? Did you get the drug or did you get the uh, the, uh, the placebo or the control or the vehicle? They're all kind of synonymous. But that person is not the one typically collecting or analyzing the data, right? They're not the one scoring the data, I should say, right? They're not the one who says, hey, that rat was more or less aggressive or seemed happier. Somebody who doesn't know if that rat received, you know, an antidepressant is the one making that decision. Just so you even sit down. All right. This is a real tricky one too, right? So you think about psychiatric disorders. What do we mean by psychiatric disorders? Uh, we're talking about things like depression, bipolar. Uh, there are even animal models of uh, autism spectrum disorder, right? So most folks are, are pretty familiar with autism spectrum disorder, right? The number one sort of uh, hallmark issue there is, is uh, I don't want to say inappropriate, poorly developed social interactions, right? Which we can, we can sort of determine that in a, in a person, right? I mean, I mean Marissa, if you were to, to see someone and you were to say, you know, a person didn't really interact in the way that they should, right? They, they, their social interactions are sort of uh, abnormal. So maybe there's something going on. We can give them some medication, some treatment, and then see what happens. Uh, if we want to study that in, in an animal, though, it becomes kind of difficult, right? How do you know if a, if a rat is, is having disordered social interactions with, uh, with other rats, right? And you can, trust me, you can. There are ways you can do it, but often what you'll see is when we're developing these animal models of psychiatric disorders, we're looking at one particular element of that, right? We're not going to be looking at all of the elements <coughs> of that particular disorder. So they'll often pull out one symptom and they'll try to address that one particular symptom with their model. Okay. So they do this, there's actually a genetic knockout uh, ma mouse that has uh, sort of repeated forelimb movements. So they'll constantly move their forelimbs. Uh, that's sort of uh, analogous to folks with autism. They, uh, they do hand flapping or they'll move their arms and hands a lot, right? So you'll see that. That doesn't address any of the other sort of symptoms or the issues. With autism spectrum disorder just develops or just addresses that one issue. So that's one of the limitations of animal models, but um, again, we can't just grab up a bunch of folks and start giving them, giving them these random drugs, right? Say, hey, try this, see if it gets you better. It may also kill you. Uh, so so we, have to, we have to try different approaches. Okay. And that's kind of the next point. When we, when we do this, we can actually screen drugs, right? Uh, in this sort of uh, preclinical setting. So we can give these drugs to animals, we can see what they do, see if they're adverse effects, see if they're fatal effects, uh, see what the side effects are. If that profile seems to be something acceptable to humans, we don't see any sort of strange reactions, then we, we move a step, right? Uh, we'll move into another, sometimes a different animal model. Sometimes you move into primates, uh, and sometimes you go straight into humans. So it just depends on the process, right? Often it depends on which country you're in, and that's a whole different discussion we could have another time. Different countries have different drug approval processes. And I don't think you have to worry about that too much. All right, so again, using animals, uh, tons of control, right? Every rat you grab can be identical, okay? So if I grab, you know, there are like 20 people in this class. Uh, if I were to grab 20 rats, I can get 20 rats that are exactly the same. I can put them in the exact same living conditions. I give them the exact same food. I can make sure the temperature in the room is the same all the time. The lighting is the same. Noise levels are gonna be identical for every single rat. Uh, their prenatal development, I've got full history, I've got the genetic background, I've got basically every single thing that I would need to know and control, right? And so when I give them a drug and I can say, well, it did or it did not work, right? And everything's going to be the same, so we'll deal with the same baseline. If I took the 20 of you and I gave you all a medication, we're going to get 20 different responses, right? And why am I getting those 20 different responses? Well, is it your diet? Is it your sleeping patterns? Is it your genetics, uh, your family history, your living environment? Did you um, exercise more or less than somebody else, right, Caleb? I mean, it's just, there are a ton of these different factors when you're dealing with people that you can't control for. You try to, as much as you can, you go, well, you know, if you're taking this medication or that medication, or you've had head trauma, maybe we kick you out of the study. But, uh, but those are really broad and sort of gross things, right? You can't really fine tune what's going on. 
So you have a ton of control over that. You also, again, can do things that aren't ethical in humans, right? So uh, there are a number of studies with, with rats where folks will administer or they will, um, if you're dealing with like, let's say, uh, drug abuse, right? So let's say you want to come up with some pharmacological treatments for drug abuse, okay? Well, what's the first thing you have to do? Well, you have to have somebody who's addicted to drugs, right? Okay, so I can't just randomly grab people off the street and start pumping heroin in them, right? That's gonna be a quick way for me to not only lose my job, uh, but for me to also like lose my ability to walk out of my house, right? Because somebody's gonna arrest me for that. <coughs> but provided I've gone through the correct protocols and I've done everything I need to do on that front, I can grab a bunch of rats and give them heroin until they become heroin addicts. And then I can give them whatever drug that I think has been developed to prevent them from being heroin addicts, right? But I can't do that to people. I can't get a person addicted to a drug and then try to fix that. It doesn't seem like a good idea, right? <clears throat> Typically, we're going to use mammals for this, um, largely because that's going to give us more similar behaviors and more similar brains, right? Mammal brains have some similar features, whether that's a rat, a monkey, a, a porcupine, and you know, they all have some similar features that are different than if you were to, you know, grab a turtle, right? Can you imagine, like, giving a turtle cocaine? Some of you are getting excited about that for some reason. Some of you have a turtle at home. You're thinking, well, taking my turtle to Hal Greer and 8th Avenue, see what I can get, and run a little experiment later. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. Although, I did listen to this NPR story recently uh, about this person in Maine who was giving their uh, lobsters marijuana. They did, true story. Uh, they, they, because they, you know, they, of course, then they killed the lobster to eat it. Because they, you know, most of the time, I don't know if you guys have eaten a lobster before, but they right in the hot water while it's squirming, right? And that's kind of how you cook a lobster. Uh, it should be alive probably when you toss it in. There's the standard way to do it. Some people think, well, that's not too ethical, so maybe we should kill it first. But then there's like whatever, right? Uh, but there's this this person up in Maine, and they basically turned their aquarium into a, like a bomb. And this is true. And they, they, they own a restaurant. Now they weren't selling those lobsters to folks to eat. They were just thinking maybe that's a more humane way to kill a lobster is, is after it's high. <laughs> I, I wish I was making that story up. I really do. But that's a true story. Uh, and they said, you know, anecdotally, that the lobster seems more relaxed when you put it in hot water. I, 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 I listen. I have no comment on this. I'm just reporting to you. Uh, what I heard on the radio. And it was NPR, so it wasn't like that weird radio station on the AM where people just make up stuff. This was like a real radio station with actual journalists, right? You guys listen to the Nas uh, National Public Radio? Okay, two people do great. Jonna does, I know why you do. You're waiting for another uh, Russian torpedo story. Waiting for it. Yeah, yeah, it's a brilliant story. Someday I'll tell you guys about the Russian torpedo. All right, so like there's a picture of a sad little girl. Um, I, I don't know how many of you like pictures of sad little girls, but there it is. Uh, the point of this is, you know, I know there are folks, it's, it's not as bad here because it's, I mean, let's be honest, it's West Virginia, right? And animal rights in West Virginia is like, I have a right to eat animals. Um, that's the definition of West Virginia animal rights. Except when it comes to goats of breeding age, you know, upon which you have to pay taxes. I don't know if you guys know this. See, every year they send you that, like, do you own things form. Do you guys ever look at that? Anybody live in West Virginia? Anybody, like, pay taxes on their cars or you just let your, let your folks handle that? Yeah, they should send you this form. And you have to, like, write down the serial or, like, the serial number of your car, right? Yeah, Kaylin's got one in there. No. It's like, <laughs> well, so on the back, it'll say, how many goats do you have of breeding age? Uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. But the point of this is animal research is necessary. It's important, right? Uh, we learn a lot of great stuff from animals. Um, in fact, I don't know, I saw a statistic a few years ago, there are actually more animals killed at humane societies than there are, right, uh, in, in sort of scientific research. Uh, as someone who's done a ton of animal research, I can tell you, they don't let you just do whatever you want. 
There are anywhere between three and five government and non-government agencies that can show up at any time and tell you like, hey, stop what you're doing, let's see if you're doing it right before I let you go on. Um, and Brandon, I can tell you that one of those agencies can be the, the DEA, uh, which, is a, which is a little frightening when you show up at work one day and there's a DEA agent waiting outside your office or your lab and they say, hey, let's see your drug records. Uh, and you're like, okay. Because uh, that can be frightening. So they can come in, USDA, the FDA, depending on what you're doing. Um, it, whoever is giving you money, most folks would get money from the National Institutes of Health, right? They can send folks in. Uh, that's, that's funded through the federal government. Um, there are a lot of other groups that do animal, um, animal wel welfare checks for, uh, you know, research institutions and so forth. So, so keep in mind, if you're reading something in a journal, you know, if you, if you found an awesome sort of article about something uh, and it involves animal research, they have gone through a ton of, uh, ton of checks to, to make sure that they can do that, okay? Questions about that? Great. <clears throat> Yeah, this is kind of important. So, a lot of the times when it comes to human research, you're just you're just kind of looking at correlational type stuff, right? Like, well, we notice that when people drink, when they're pregnant, when their kids are born, they have certain sort of features and, and, and developmental issues, but we can't directly prove anything, right? Because we're not, again, we're not able to take a bunch of pregnant mothers and pump them full of alcohol and see what happens to their offspring. Seems like a bad idea. You can do this with rats, though, and so fetal alcohol syndrome is a great example of that, right? How this was demonstrated through animal research. And there's that strict animal guideline business. Here's a bunch of stuff. I, you don't need to memorize any of this. This is these health extension acts and all of these things. Um, if you're doing animal research in a lab, you do have to know these, right? You have to kind of follow these things. Uh, for you folks, just know that there are rules that govern um, humane animal treatment. Sometimes folks get carried away. I hate when they, I don't know, I saw this in the ad, I was reading like the Lexington newspaper once, the Herald Leader, I don't know if you guys have ever, you know, Lexington, Kentucky's a place. Uh, I was reading that newspaper once and in the class, why I was reading classifieds, I don't know, right? I was just like flipping through, see what's in there. Um, see, you always wanna see what people have for sale or what they wanna buy. Cause you think, well, you know, maybe I've got a box of that at home I've been dying to get rid of and somebody's gonna pay top dollar for it. Uh, I know, uh, Jacob, you got all those beanie babies sitting in your basement. Well, you're ready, ready to dump them on somebody, right? Uh, <clears throat> but there was an ad in there like, watch out for research scientists that are in your neighborhood stealing your dogs. It's like, that's ridiculous. Uh, and I, I got really mad about it and I yelled a bunch of things that probably shouldn't have just into the air. Um, and then I just realized that that person's an idiot. So <clears throat> I went on. Uh, why would, but that, that is something. You know, a lot of folks get worried because, oh man, the, those crazy guys in those lab coats are going to come steal your cat or your dog, right? But there are a ton of reasons why we would never do that, okay? And they all go back to control of those living conditions, right? If I'm going to bother to grab somebody's dog or cat to do a study, I'm just going to grab the person, right? Because, I mean, I'm wanting to do human, I mean, I want to figure out what this drug does on a human. If I'm just going to randomly grab an animal over which I don't have any control of its food, its genetics, of anything else, I'm just going to grab a person and do it. I'm not going to bother with your dog. It seems like a waste of time. It's unscientific to grab these animals randomly, right? Uh, that's why we don't do that. <clears throat> I guess the caveat there is B.F. Skinner, right? Should I, should I talk about B.F. Skinner and his pigeon traps? So you guys know B.F. Skinner? Anybody heard of him? Uh, so he did a bunch of behavioral work. Now this was obviously a long time ago, before like 1985 and a lot of these other regulations. But he would go on top of the building wherever he worked and he would use a big net and catch pigeons for his behavioral studies. It's a true story. And then he trained them to guide missiles. That's also a true story. And then somebody in the military was like, uh, man, we can guide these with lasers. And he was like, all right. But, you know, the Navy still uses a ton of, you know, like underwater mammals and things for detonating mines. They let those dolphins swim right into the mines and blow up. Marissa, I don't think that's how that works. All right, what do we have so we need to know? You always have to figure out some way, if you can, that doesn't use animals, right? 
and you're definitely going to avoid, minimize uh, discomfort, stress, and pain. Animal tests are easy if it's like measuring blood pressure. Animals have blood pressure. That's easy to measure, right? You get one of those little blood pressure cuffs just on a rat's leg and you can go, well, 120 over 80. Uh, it's probably not going to be 120 over 80, you know, because it's a rat. It's going to have a different normal blood pressure or whatever. Uh, but that's easy, right? I mean, it's easy to measure blood pressure. If you wanted to measure uh, cortisol levels, some kind of hormone, that would be really easy to measure, right? You can measure that up or down. But you start thinking about these other things. Uh, how many of you know about schizophrenia, right? People have these delusions of grandeur. Well, what if I developed a rat that had schizophrenia? Well, one, how would I even know? I mean, what did this rat, right? What did this rat think about it? So, I mean, did it think it was like the rat FBI was after it all the time, or, or it was, I don't know, some deified rat? And it was like the, you know, the leader of all rats. I, I don't know, some famous rat in history. You know, like come back. I don't know, right? Uh, how do you know if a rat has delusions? So that's like a really difficult thing to do if you're trying to. And uh, basically, we just want to kind of predict what's going on, not a big deal. We do, we do typically want to look for a dose-response relationship, right? When we, when we do these tests, so often you will see that animals will be given, or humans if we're doing human research, different amounts of the drug to see if you can get a, a larger or smaller effect, right? And reliability is the key. Same thing should happen every time, right? Every time you give a rat drug A, the same behavioral changes should occur, right? And that should occur roughly the same for all rats, right? That you would give that to, so that'd be the same. So what do we want to do if we want to test behaviors? There are a ton of things that you can measure, right? Some of them are kind of easy. You definitely tell if a rat has tremors, right? So what if you're working on uh, some kind of anti-Parkinson's drug, right? You've developed a rat strain or a mouse strain that has tremors. You give it the drug, you can tell if it has, you know, reduction in tremor intensity. That seems pretty easy, right? Okay. We can measure motor activity, right? I used to do a lot of this with rats. We would give them, um, like, cocaine, and then we would give them... Uh, dopamine receptor blockers and see if that, you know, changed their locomotor activity. If you give a rat cocaine, it moves around a lot. I don't know if you guys would have thought that would happen or not, but it does. Uh, but you can give them uh, dopamine receptor blockers of different kinds and sometimes you can reduce that locomotor activity. Also, operating conditioning. How many of you know about this? Right? Rat presses a lever, a rat gets a reward. That's pretty awesome. Uh, this is a great way to measure sort of cognitive changes, right? So you can uh, measure if rats are better or worse at learning rules or remembering things or adjusting if rules are changed. Anybody ever trained a rat to press a lever? Nobody? Well, you guys haven't lived. Uh, I guess need to do that. I wish we had that in our, uh, in our learning class. We would we need more rats in this building. <laughs> I think you made an odd face to that. I mean, uh, you could just like teach a dog to sit. I guess. But a dog, you have to walk it. <laughs> a rat, you just put a wheel. It takes care of itself. Uh, don't get bogged down with all this like fixed ratio business, I'm not going to ask you about it. Hey, here's a rat in a box. And the rat presses a lever, right, there's a lever, when that light comes on, and guess what comes out of here? Hershey's Kisses. Uh, no, some kind of rat treat, right? Something that rats like, sometimes it can be these little uh, sucrose pellets or, um, you know, food of, of some different kind. Uh, sometimes you will control the food intake of this rat so that you know it's like time for it to be hungry when it goes in here to do its its work, right? So that it'll be kind of motivated to press that lever and then get a, get a treat. 
Um, you could you could change this a little bit if you wanted. Maybe every time the rat presses a lever, it gets a squirt of cocaine, right? So there's that. That can happen uh, if you want to do some kind of drug study. Uh, you can do something like that. But this is a, this is an operant chamber. Uh, sometimes folks call that a Skinner box, right? That's not a box where you're going to skin an animal. It's named after B. F. Skinner, just to, to clarify that, right? We used to have some of these in this bill. I took them and put them somewhere else. But, uh, okay, so what if we want to measure pain? Right, a lot of drugs are going to reduce pain transmission. So if we're doing this, one's called the tail flick test. Basically, we put a little bit of heat on an animal's tail, right? And we see how long it takes for that tail to flick away, right? So if you can imagine if you had a tail for a moment and I put that tail on the oven burner, how long would it take you to get your tail off the burner, right? That's really what we're doing. Uh, the longer the animal leaves the tail on the, the heat source, the uh, greater we assume the uh, drug is at, at uh, alleviating pain. It's pretty straightforward, right? So if you give them some Tylenol, they're going to go, oh, that's pretty fast. If you give them some morphine, they'll leave the tail on there for a little bit longer, like, uh, oh, okay, maybe I'm feeling pain. So there you go. That's a nice picture of a rat with a hot tail. <laughs> there are other things you can do typically involving heat as well. Don't worry about that too much. That's just a basic idea. They can do foot shock. Uh, right. Uh, what about learning and memory? So if we wanted to measure that. One of the things we can do is uh, mazes, right? I think it's called T mazes or other kinds of mazes, radial arm mazes. This is a radial arm maze, right? And so this particular one has sort of eight arms. Put a tree out in some of the arms. You put the rat in the middle. First time in, the rat's going to kind of explore and then it'll find a tree. Awesome. The next time you put the rat in, how long does it take to go back to that same treat location or, or this treat location, right? Um, so that's a good measure of learning, like how great is that rat at learning, right? If you were to give this rat a drug that would enhance or decrease cognitive capacity, right, then you would anticipate some changes in how long it takes the rat to learn where the treats are located, right? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, Morris water maze, that's a fun one. This is when you take a kiddie pool fill it up with uh, some water. Typically you'll put some kind of dye in the water or you'll use a clear platform. Rats don't like being dropped in pools of water, I'm just going to let you know that. Anybody has a pet rat and you try to give it a bath, it's not going to go well. Anybody have a pet rat? Anybody's going to own up to that. I got a kid. Yeah, you can just drop them in the water, right? <laughs> so fill up a pool, put a little soap in there, toss them in. I mean, they'll flail around enough to get clean. <laughs> Seems like a pretty good method to me. <coughs> I mean, I'd have one of those, uh, those poles with a hook on the end in case you got to pull it out out of the water in case there's a problem, but it seems reasonable. So you drop the rat in the water, it's going to swim around. Eventually, it'll find that platform, right? Again, you can give it different drug treatments, see how fast or slow it learns where that platform is. Seems pretty straightforward, right? Not a big deal. Uh, there are also these delayed response tests. Don't worry too much about that. Um, rats aren't going to be terribly great at this. That's why they've drawn a picture of a monkey, right? So monkeys have a little bit bigger brains than rats, only slightly smaller brains than you. So that's something. So they go, hey, look, there's food here. And then they shut the gate. And then the monkey has to figure out, hey, where's the food? And it'll go, whoa, it's right there blade matching. How do you know this is a monkey? I told you it was and it has a tail. All monkeys have tails. Apes don't. So that's a big one for me. Brandon, I know you've already heard that, but I'm going to tell this class. Chimpanzees, they're apes. They don't have tails. They're not monkeys. I hate when people are at the zoo telling their kids, like, hey, look at that monkey. It's like, well, that was three exhibits over. Uh, this is a chimpanzee. You guys ever go to zoos? Yeah, Caitlin, you've been to, I don't know, you, you might be a member of the Knoxville Zoo. 
for all I know. That's not. You ever been to the Knoxville Zoo? I went there once when I was like seven. But throw that out. All right, measures of anxiety, right? So uh, odds are you know someone who is on a drug to treat anxiety, right? That's a pretty, pretty common diagnosis. Uh, how do we do that in, in um, humans? Well, we, we know if some, right? If I give you a drug that reduces anxiety and you're like, boy, that exam next week, not a big deal. You know, there you go. Anti-anxiety medication's working. Uh, if uh, you're a rat, though, then you have to think about, well, how, how, how does that work? Right? And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll use fear as an analogy for, for anxiety. So we'll do something that scares a rat. If we give it a drug that reduces anxiety and we try to scare it, it's not going to get us frightened, right? Uh, one of these is this light, dark crossing task. Rats, among many other animals, will avoid brightly lit areas. The reason for that is if it's in a brightly lit area, something can eat it and see it, right? So you want to hang out in the dark. Uh, but if you give a rat an anti-anxiety medication, it'll spend more time than normal uh, out of the dark area and into the light. Right? So it'll kind of get out and explore around. What about open field studies, open field tests? Uh, basically, it's the same idea. Most rodents will hug the wall, right? So they're like you that time when you were nine and got invited to a skating party. And you didn't know how to skate. And you were just like hanging onto the wall the whole time. Your mom was yelling at you to get out into the middle of the floor and not look like an idiot. If that happened to anybody? They still have skating parties. They still have places where you go roller skate. When I was in like Is that middle a thing? School. When you were in middle school, that's what I thought. Anybody roller skate on a regular basis? <laughs> oh, Brandon's looking around like, we're the weirdos in this class. <laughs> Jacob, did you watch that show, uh, Sharp Objects, on HBO? I did, and there was a bunch of roller skating in it. <laughs> I don't know why. What year was it set in? Like now. Oh. Yeah, like, like, like she had an iPod. <laughs> I mean, but there was this, like this group, there was like this roller skating gang of girls. I'm serious, I'm not joking. I guess if you're in roller derby, that's acceptable, right? That's like the one time it's acceptable to still use roller skates. But these weren't roller derby. These were like high school girls just like <coughs> roller skating around in this town. I don't know. It was a weird show. Uh, oh, elevated plus maze, that's something too. Uh, so here's a, here's a plus maze. If you're a normal rat, you're going to hang out in these sort of uh, protected areas. But again, you give them that anti-anxiety medication and they're going to come out on the ledges, right? And they're going to be like, whoa, this is cool. Look at this better view. And you could think about, you know, you'd do the same thing, right? If I, you know, imagine you're the size of this rat and I stick you up on top of this nice elevated plus maze uh, and I stick you over here, you're going to spend more time in these protected regions than you might, you know, out here, especially if you're, you know, you're prone to some anxiety. But if you, you know, double up on your anti-anxiety meds, you might just, you know, start hanging off the edge. I don't know. Zero maze, you don't have to worry about that. Social interactions. Uh, it's not too big of a deal, right? But we can measure changes in uh, social interactions, particularly with mice. Mice tend to be pretty aggressive. Rats are fairly... Uh, friendly, right, and kind of, you know, pet rats and so forth. Mice get a little aggressive, and so you can start to uh, do some tests, right? So they'll come over and spend more time, you know, checking out strangers or something. You can measure those changes in time. This is an interesting one. Uh, novelty suppressed feeding, right? So if you give an animal sort of an unusual food, uh, they'll, they'll often not want to eat that, right? So Because they don't know. Is that food going to make me sick? I don't know what it is. Is it going to kill me? Uh, if there's something kind of novel to it. Obviously, if you give them an anti-anxiety medication, then they're more likely to go, well, I'll give it a try.
Yeah, we don't need to talk about ultrasonic localizations, but they're kind of fun. Uh, we do want to talk about conditioned emotional response. This is a pretty standard, you know, flash of light, shock a rat kind of paradigm. You guys will probably read a, a fair bit about that, especially for those of you handling um, the, the chapter on anti-anxiety medications. Right. Uh, basically, if you continue to shock that rat every time you flash a light, the next time you um, flash that light, the rat will kind of go, whoa, something bad's going to happen kind of go into that freezing behavior. Uh, what about depression? That's kind of difficult to measure in a rat, right? Like, how do you know if, uh, if a rat's depressed? Well, I love this one, the behavioral despair, right? Uh, basically, it's a forced swim test. So basically, you, you put a rat down in a, in a tube full of water with no way out, right? <laughs> I know this is, oh, that's a great test, right? But um, if a rat is depressed, it will just kind of give up, right? If you think about people who are depressed, what do they often do? Like, well, I'm not going to do that. That's too much effort. And so they end up just kind of like, you know, sit on their couch or whatever. Uh, rats will do the same thing. If a rat's depressed, it'll stop swimming sooner than a rat that's not depressed, right? If it's not depressed, it's going to go, I can get out of here, I promise. Always look at the bright side, right? Just keep swimming. Um, and then if it is depressed, the rat goes, well, oh, there's no hope. I'm just going to hold my breath until I sink to the bottom. And then it just kind of goes, blurp, blurp, goes, goes down. That, that's true. You can see it. Uh, there's also the tail suspension test, right? Uh, you can, you can kind of uh, hang these mice from their tails and see what happens. Yep, there's a forced swim test. That's the Michael Phelps of the rodent world. It's going to get a sub sandwich afterward. Uh, Learn helplessness is basically the same idea. This is something, this sounds like, you know, chronic mild unpredictable stress, right? So basically you give them these like stressful events, you make their environment cold, give them wet bedding, kind of restrain them a little bit. Uh, what's interesting is this is a way to create depression in a rodent, right? So if you continue to kind of do these unpredictable, stressful events, the rat will eventually start to behave in a way that looks, at least at that, you know, at that face validity sort of level, it looks like depression, right? And then you can treat that with antidepressants and see what happens. Or you can let them be beaten up by other rats all the time. That's one too, right? This uh, chronic social defeat stress. Uh, obviously, taking pups away from mothers creates uh, stress and depression as well, and then you can sort of uh, use that. Later, you can, um, you know, once you've kind of significantly stressed them out, they do something called anhedonia, right? Which means they don't really, don't really get a lot of pleasure out of things in life. And so again, we're thinking about this is a pretty standard uh, I think that folks who are depressed will, will report. Uh, if you give rats the opportunity to um, drink sucrose, normally they would do that, right? I mean, would you rather have something sugary or would you rather have just plain water? Um, and you're usually going to take something sugary. And if you don't believe me, like look at what's in your refrigerator, look at what's on your desk, uh, look at what you're thinking about right now for, for drinking when you get home. You'd rather have something with some flavor to it, right? And rats will do the same thing. I think this is kind of interesting because how often have you dealt with someone who, who's dealing with depression and you're like, hey, well, let's go out and, and let's do something fun and here it is and they're like, uh, it's not going to be any good, right? And you're like, you just don't understand. Well, this makes perfect sense, right? I mean, once they've developed that in it becomes difficult. So other, other solutions need to be offered. Please don't ask me what those are because I don't know. Um, but this is a great time, Jacob, when I can advertise for the clinic, right? So if you guys uh, are dealing with uh, an issue or you know someone who is up on the fourth floor, uh, for students it's free, just it's pretty awesome, right? Because uh, normally that costs you somewhere around seven or eight million dollars an hour. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how much it costs to go see a mental health professional. It's expensive though, right? Depending on the insurance, I guess. Yeah, right? I mean, you can pay a hundred bucks an hour or something for it out of your pocket. It's free if you go up there or if you need to let somebody know about it. Um, 
they can't help you, they'll, they'll find somebody who can. Hey, what about drugs? Those are rewarding, right? Uh, a lot of times to, to measure drug rewards, they'll do the self-administration method. So they'll just basically give a, um, give a rat free access to a drug, cocaine, heroin, whatever. Uh, press a lever, get a score to drug, right? You can measure the sort of abuse potential of that drug by, by how often the rat goes over and hits the lever, right? If it's a drug that's not, uh, you know, like caffeine, for example, right? I mean, there aren't really people who abuse caffeine. So the rat's going to go over and go, oh, man, I'll take a little caffeine. It felt pretty good when I hit that wheel, you know, run an extra, I don't know, five meters. I don't know how far rats run on, on those wheels. And then you're like, oh, I'll get a little more caffeine. It's not a big deal, right? But if you slip something in there, uh, you know, like methamphetamine or something, uh, then the rat's just going to, like, lay on the button, right? Constantly be getting squirts of methamphetamine. So there you go. And that's the basic setup, right? Lever, drug. So Not is this where we talk about Rat Park? Uh, rat Park has a lot of problems, so I'd rather not talk about Rat Park. But people will tell you about Rat Park, I guess. I mean, do you want to tell them about Rat Park? No, that's fine. You don't need to know about Rat Park. Yeah, that guy, uh, what was his name, Bruce? Was it Bruce? They don't want to talk about the researcher. Huh? No, I mean, I've never heard them talk about the researcher. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, so it's like, so oh, fine. So, it was like they did the self-administration thing, but they kept the rat, like, all by itself, and so it just kept, like, self-administering into it OD. And then when put in an environment, more like a natural environment, hypothetically, with other things to do, like a wheel or other rats around, it chose not to self-administer so much that it would be. Yeah. Which makes some sense, right? I'm not saying that's inaccurate. But that guy actually had some problems. Like, he, uh, mm -hmm. like other folks hadn't been able to replicate that. There were some problems with how he got that, that experiment set up. It's always more of a story, right? You should check into a thing. Some of it compared to the Vietnam War. Yeah, no, there's some interesting things in there. Uh, there really are. Um, and I think there are some lessons to, to take out of it, but folks have had difficulty making that happen again. It's not saying it wouldn't happen again. Uh, there's one important concept here called the breaking point, which is kind of interesting. Uh, some drugs have a really high break point, and some of them have a lower breaking point. And basically what this means is like, how much effort are you going to put into something to get that reward, right? So, um, like chocolate, right? I mean, what if I said, uh, you know, if you, if you will um, go wash my car, pick up my dry cleaning, and um, I don't know, give Caleb's kid a bath, I'm trying to think of some things. I'll give you a Hershey's bar. Most of you are gonna go, that's stupid. Uh, even if you have, you know, if you're, you know, like really want the caffeine, right? You're like, really, I gotta have caffeine. It's not worth it, right? Um, but if you're a, a cocaine addict, for example, and I said, hey, uh, I need you to like build my house for some cocaine, you're like, sure, I'm on it. Uh, you know, uh, because cocaine has a high breaking point. So there's like much more effort that you will put into it to get. That, um, that substance, right, to get that reward. That makes sense, right? Because, I, I, you know, when we think about folks who, who have substance abuse problems, we'll, we'll often think about some of the crazy things that, it seems crazy to you if you're not dealing with that substance abuse problem. Like, why did you go through all of that effort to get that drug? Well, it's got a pretty high breaking point. And later we'll talk about some of the neurochemical and neuro neurological things going on. Right? Uh, so self-administration, not a big deal there. Uh, instead of the drug, sometimes we can actually just bypass that and activate the brain regions involved in the reward pathway, right? And so they can just zap themselves with a little bit of electrical current in there, kind of mimic that signal they would get, and basically the same thing happens. So you have a pathway uh, from the ventral tegmental area 
to the nucleus accumbens. Right? And when that guy gets activated, whatever activates that, that's rewarding, and that's something you're going to repeat. Okay? No matter what it is. It can be using cocaine, it can be studying for an exam, it can be taking care of your kids. All of these are positive, rewarding things. And, and by positive, I don't mean something necessarily that's good for you, I just mean it has a positive effect on your, your mood and, and your, um, you know, because we're dumping a bunch of dopamine in. Uh, but if you were to, to stimulate this brain region and cause the release of dopamine here, then you would get the same. It would be, it'd be basically the same thing. So there you go, right? We'll just give everybody a brain implant, see what happens. We're all going to die is what would happen. These people just like constantly hit the button uh, until the battery died. And then when the battery died, if you were still alive, you go through severe withdrawal. So there you go. That was a quick story, wasn't it? But fast outcome. Um, condition place preference. Obviously, an animal is going to go to a place where it gets a reward instead of a place where it doesn't. Right? Not a big deal. Drug discrimination. This is kind of interesting. Um, this is a way to see if when you take a drug, it feels the same, right? So if you train a rat to take a certain drug, uh, and that can be a drug for you know, therapeutic purposes or recreational purposes, uh, you, you train this rat to do it, and then you give it some other drug. If the, the rat, you know, can't tell the difference between the two drugs, it'll take them equally, right? Just kind of random chance, it'll take one drug or the other, give them the option to choose between the two. If it can tell the difference, it'll choose the one, you know, that it was trained to take. So that's kind of interesting. Right, translational research, FDA gets involved. Uh, you know, this is a kind of a standard statement. Only about 20% of new drugs actually get to that final approval. Right? So the FDA is there, kind of a watchdog. They're kind of interesting what the FDA does and does not do. Right? If something is a medication, uh, the FDA will get involved in that. If it is a food, the FDA will get involved in that. If it is a dietary supplement, the FDA doesn't care. Yeah? There's a special plant called uh, Kratom that they've been focusing on very intensely, but like they've been trying to portray it in a really weird manner. Like, by, <clears throat> I don't know. That, uh, it's, that's like an herbal supplement that they, they are getting involved with. They will. Um, if it's labeled as a dietary supplement, uh, think everything you have to Orrin Hatch for this. Uh, for those of you that don't know Orrin Hatch, you should. Um, they're only sort of, Utah is known for really two things, right? Um, and one of those is dietary supplements, okay? So uh, the senator from Utah, Orrin Hatch, decided a long time ago that dietary supplements shouldn't fall under the FDA jurisdiction, right? So anything that you can get labeled as a dietary supplement can go to shelves without the FDA approving it. Now, Caleb, the backside of this is if enough people start complaining like, man, I took that dietary supplement, crazy things happened, the FDA will get involved and they'll investigate and they'll take a look at it and they'll say, okay, this is a drug that's dangerous or it's not, it's been contaminated or what's going on. But it actually takes consumers to complain about it after it's already been on the market, right? So after it's already available for folks. The FDA won't get proactively involved in that. So, uh, bigger, faster, stronger. Is that? Have you seen that documentary, Jacob? Yeah, it's a crazy documentary. Isn't it? And then he also. I haven't seen the second one yet. Uh, Prescription thugs. So that's supposed to be even better. But this guy, Chris Bell, he did a, a documentary uh, on this. He basically went to Home Depot, hired some migrant workers to come to his house, start packaging, and they made pills at his house that he went and sold at a. Uh, like an exercise and fitness show. Uh, and then he didn't have to put, you know, the FDA didn't have to get involved. He didn't have to really label it. He was just like, well, here's sort of what's in it. The rest is a proprietary blend. Uh, they don't even have to tell you what's in these things, which is pretty crazy, right? Uh, I don't know. So that tells you what the FDA does and does not do, right? They will get involved if you complain enough about something, but that's a dietary supplement, but otherwise they won't get involved. But other stuff you put in your body, they'll get involved in that. Seems like a weird category of things that they, you know, that they're not investing. So you don't know what's in there, right? In these uh, dietary supplements. Arsenic, probably. 
Actually, Jacob, I saw this interesting uh, article. They were like analyzing protein powders, and they actually found that protein powders labeled as organic were more likely to contain like contaminants, including arsenic. I thought, I know, right? I thought that was pretty interesting, right? I'm going to buy this organic, uh, yeah, it's full of that organic arsenic. So there you go. Anybody do protein powders on a regular basis? No. You see them though, right? The dietary supplement things. All right. Uh, so basically, from the time a drug's developed until it gets to the market um, is um, forever. Right? That's a long, a long time. We're talking you know, 15 years or something sometimes, right? So you have these promising developments, and then uh, finally things make it. And then they still monitor it, right? They continue to monitor it for side effects. Sometimes the FDA lets something slide through that's not good for you, right? How many times have you guys heard about recalls of medications or certain things going off the market, right? It happens. Mm -hmm. And then we test things in humans, uh, genetic disorders, brain lesions, you guys know about this stuff. These are just different kinds of models for research. I don't expect you to know too much about that. Uh, we can test for impulsivity. Uh, this is if, if you have a rat and you want to put something in a specific location in a rat's brain, you have to use a device like this, right, to locate that. It uses 3D coordinate system, and you can, uh, can locate where that is deep in that rat's brain, and you can either inject a drug or a chemical or, you know, something that's going to turn off or turn on the brain. Hey, and there's a slice of a rat brain showing you some deep location. Here's the same idea for humans, right? So if you need to get inside, inside somebody's, you know, a human's brain, use this device. Obviously, it's shaped a little bit differently because it's a human head, not a rat head, but it's the same idea, right? You got some 3D coordinate system, you're going to get in there and uh, take care of that. And, and animals often will destroy part of their brain, will create a brain lesion, and then see what kind of behavior they have afterward, right? Uh, you can even give them neurotoxins, right? you can squirt things in them, destroy the cells. Not a big deal. This is kind of a cool setup. So there's like a there's a rat in here and it's got all these tubes coming into its brain. What it's actually doing is, is pulling out some of the uh, fluid there, right? The uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And they're measuring what chemicals are diluted in that uh, cerebrospinal fluid, right? Uh, this is a great way to look for neurotransmitter release, right, or other chemicals so you can measure if we give this rat a drug, does that increase dopamine? Does it increase serotonin, right? Does it have changes, brain changes uh, at the chemical level? So you do this kind of microdialysis approach. There's another approach called uh, fast cyclic voltammetry, which is a little different. All of these neurotransmitters have their, have sort of a unique um, electrical signal, right? And you can measure the change in that electrical signal over time and see if there's an increase or decrease in release. That's pretty cool because you can do it real time. Uh, it's a little more complicated than microdialysis, but it's still pretty cool. Don't worry too much about how this works. Uh, there we're talking, that's uh, voltammetry. Not a big deal. Uh, this is sort of uh, deep brain stimulation, right? So this is another thing that you might uh, you might run across, uh, particularly for Parkinson's disease. They will put these electrodes down in a person's brain, and they will sort of stimulate the brain regions that are at fault, um, and that seems to have some seems to help. Uh, deep brain stimulation has also been used to treat other. Uh, other things like depression, intractable depression. Obviously, this isn't your first go-to, right? You walk into your uh, mental health professional, 
uh, Jacob, I'm going to walk in. And I'm going to say, hey, I've been feeling a little down lately. And you're like, all right, hold still. We're going to put two holes in your head, and we're going to jab in some electrical uh, devices and guarantee to make you feel better. I know there's a whole host of other things you want to try first, right? Uh, there are all kinds of behavioral therapies. Um, I don't know what kind of therapy things are out there. Uh, and then medications of different varieties, different things before you go into brain surgery. So those are in there constantly? Or there's a period of stimulation? They're always in there and you're getting like, periodic stimulation. You know, if you zap it once, it's like, well, I feel better for a few minutes, but you kind of have to constantly um, you know, have some kind of uh, electrical source coming in. Let's see. There's a monkey getting some juice. Monkeys like juice. That's interesting, right? Uh, this is showing you what we call like microelectrode recordings. So basically, we've taken up an electrode and put it into this monkey's brain so we can record those electrical signals, right? And we can record electrical signals from different brain regions while the monkey's doing a task, and we can see if it gets excited, uh, you know, while it's doing something. So that's kind of interesting. I don't know if you guys, well, I don't know if you guys have run across any patch clamp stuff, so we may not think about that. If you need to think about patch clamping, it's there. And radio light and light as we don't need to think about that. Receptor binding. These are kind of interesting techniques. I don't expect you to know much about these. It's basically a way to determine if, um, if the substance the drug you're putting in that you've kind of labeled with this radioactive um, molecule, if that is actually binding in the right locations or where it's binding in the uh, in the brain, right? So you can kind of look at that, uh, look at that a little bit. There are some problems with it, but you might might run across that. What do we want to think about immunocytochemistry? This is a whole set of techniques here where you basically take thin slices of a brain and you expose it to a set of chemicals to see what other substances are present there, right? To see if there's, a, you know, different uh, uh, proteins, different neurotransmitters, whatever it is that we're, we're looking for. There are, uh, you guys might run across these genome-wide assay or association studies. Um, basically, what folks are doing with this is they look at somebody's DNA and they look to see if there are any sort of uh, weird spots, right? Like these, uh, they call them SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Uh, so you're going to have uh, things that might be slightly different from one person to another, right? So that's going to vary. If you can map out that variation, right, and you can see that folks uh, who have one version of that gene tend to have a particular disorder or disease, then you can say, hey, there's some association there, right? So if you get a, a copy of the, the gene that looks like this, you're more likely to develop this disease or disorder than if you get copies that look like something else, right? These are pretty cool because you can, uh, you can get a lot of data, a lot of information from these, right? It's kind of interesting. Uh, but again, we're looking at these sort of small variations sometimes, which is kind of sometimes troubling. But there you go. Uh, what about brain imaging? That's kind of fun, right? Most of the time when you're doing brain imaging, you are looking at um, you know, blood flow, you're looking at oxygen use, Glucose, right, that's the energy source for your entire body, but particularly your brain. So there are different things. You might see these like uh, 2-deoxyglucose radiography. Basically, you're just looking at the use of glucose and oxygen in the brain. Uh, brain regions that seem to have an uptick are obviously brain regions you think are activated, right? So if there are brain regions that are overactive in a particular 
disorder, you give somebody a drug to treat that, you would anticipate a reduction in their, uh, you know, 2-AG activity. CFOS is kind of similar. You can um, do amniocytic chemistry for that. Hey, what about a CT scan? All right, folks are probably familiar with that. Uh, this is something you can do to someone without cutting their head open, which most people prefer. Right? It's basically just a series of X-rays. You know, it's you know three or five hundred X-rays, something like that. You get a nice three D image of the structure. Uh, CT scans are great to show you like damage, lesions, structural abnormalities, but they're not giving you any any real time measure of function, right? And that's a CT scanner. Here's kind of the image that you would get from that. Got a big problem right there. Right? Not a big deal. But again, we're not getting any function. MRI is pretty similar, right? But we're using magnetic waves. We can get a map of the person's brain. But again, we're not getting any sort of functional issue. We're not, we're not seeing what brain activity is in different regions, right? There are There is fMRI, functional magnetic resonance. Imaging. We'll talk about that later. Uh, diffusion tensor is kind of interesting. It measures uh, water molecules and their orientation, and it will let you know, um, you know, like which brain regions are connected, which is kind of cool. PET scans, basically the same idea, right? We're getting an image of the person's brain. Got to see what's going on from time to time. Uh, PET scans will let you know when a particular um, area is being. Um, used, you stick in these uh, drugs that have been labeled radioactively and you can kind of tell when they're, when they're being uh, you know, taken out by different regions of the brain. You can assume those brain regions are active. Uh, here's fMRI. Uh, seems to be probably one of the best. It looks at uh, you know, like um, oxygen use. Let's move on. Well, I was hoping we could see a picture of an MRI, but don't worry about it. Basically with an MRI you you give somebody, uh, you know, kind of look at their brain, normal state, and then you would uh, give them some task or give them a drug and see what brain regions are active. Subtract the two and see whatever's left over and you know, hey, that's the difference. EEG, a lot of folks have probably had EEGs, right? Um, it's fairly standard, fairly easy to do. Slap some electrodes on your head. Um, if anybody's had a sleep study, right, that's something that, uh, that they would do for a sleep study is they would give you a, an EEG. Or if they thought there was some sort of head injury, maybe, or um, you know, other sort of issue going on, they might do this. It's non-invasive. It looks uncomfortable, but it's not invasive, right? And then what they're doing is they're just measuring electrical signals uh, sort of from the surface of the brain. Oh, we should talk about genetic engineering. That's fun, right? Just wait until you all decide to have kids and, and make them all like you know tall. And, I don't know, whatever. You don't want them too tall because then you're gonna have trouble buying pants. So keep that in mind. Uh, really, why are we interested in genetic engineering? Well, once we figure out that a particular gene is responsible for a disorder, we can. Um, can develop a, an animal model, right, that exhibits that. So we can either knock out, remove that gene, or knock in, we can put in a gene that would cause a problem, right? And we can use this to develop particular models of um, disorders, right? And then we can try to treat those uh, particular disorders. Don't really need to worry about this too much. Right, some of you can get a little bogged down with it, uh, but basically, you find a, a, a gene that makes a particular protein that's important. You can remove it, you can add in a protein, and you're you're good to go. We call these uh, transgenic. Sometimes we use the word transgenic mice. Uh, again, they do this for like human disorders, right? So if you know that the genes, particularly with Huntington's disease. We know the gene in the human that's responsible for that. We can just squirt that into a mouse. Trust me, it's more complicated than that, but you don't want to know. Uh, we'll squirt it into the mouse DNA. All of a sudden, that mouse develops Huntington's disease. We can figure out how to try to treat that. 
Now, there are some problems. One, most behaviors uh, and, and disorders that um, cause a change in your behaviors are, are controlled by multiple genes, right? It's usually, usually not one gene to one problem, okay? So if you do those genome-wide association studies, you might find 15 or 20 or 100 genes that are associated with schizophrenia, for example, right? Uh, so it would be complicated to try to support all those into a mouse DNA, right? And that may or may not be practical. But you can find one or two that are maybe associated with particular problems and try to address that. told you. Uh, here's some mice. This is a normal, what we call a wild type mice, my mouse, abbreviated WT. It's a mouse we've not done anything to. It's just a regular mouse, right? We definitely uh, know its breeding history. We know its food and diet. You know, it's been scientifically controlled, but we've not done anything with its DNA. Here's a mouse where they injected uh, the Huntington uh, allele of that DNA, and you can see, obviously, the two completely different sort of motor behaviors, right? which you would anticipate, Huntington's disease being a, um, a motor disorder. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's not, not too big of a deal. But you guys definitely will read papers and studies with transgenic mice. Hey, this is cool, optogenetics. Who loves lasers? I had anticipated a slightly more robust response, but that's okay. Uh, so lasers are pretty cool, right? Uh, this is actually really interesting. So they take this DNA, and they got it from this, uh, this sort of bacteria, don't worry about it. Basically, they take DNA, and they put it into brain cells, and that DNA that they put in makes ion channels. Remember, we talked about ion channels before. But these ion channels, instead of opening and closing with the neurotransmitter, they open and close when they're exposed to light in particular wavelengths of light. So then you're thinking like, well, how am I getting light into my brain, right? That's the next problem. So how you do that is you cut a hole in the skull and you stick in a fiber optic cable and then you zap a laser through that fiber optic cable and then it'll cause those ion channels to open or close. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's the wave of the future. That's really not the wave of the future. Because you think, well now, like, wow, couldn't I just like treat a neurological disorder by doing that to a human? And you most certainly could but it's going to require a hole in your head. It's actually a new approach, and it's just basically showing you that. Um, it's actually a new approach where they are using the kind of the front end of this optogenetics, where they're tricking your cells to make a, a receptor in an ion channel, right? But instead of it being gated by something you already make in your body, or by light, it's gated by some weird drug you've never heard of, and that they give it to you in a pill, and you take it, it doesn't do anything to anywhere else in your body, except those few cells that now have those receptors shaped like that drug, and then those ion channels open and close, which is so much better because we don't have a permanent hole in your head with like a battery zapping you, you know, with a laser every time you have a problem. You just take a pill once a day, and it activates those neurons. It's really, now periodically, you might have to have a little booster injection of that DNA, but it seems like a much better approach to me. It's going to be a little while. Remember, like 15 years probably before you see this in humans. But they're actually already doing optogenetics in uh, monkeys. So that, this probably came out 10 years ago, this technique. So we're already doing it in monkeys, so maybe we'll be humans next. I think they call them bespoke receptors, what I was just telling you about. That's probably going to catch up. Uh, because I think the front end's the same. It's this back end part that's different, and that back end part's not nearly as invasive if you're just taking a pill, right? So that should catch up soon. Hey, and there's a, there's a rat with a laser going into its head. It's pretty cool, right? I don't know. Um, in fact, I think that might be a fake picture. Uh, because you, you really wouldn't want the light to leak out up here, right? Because you want the light to go down into the brain. And there's not really, this is not good, there should be some dental cement here, right? To keep that secured in the rat's head. 
uh, and then the hair is going to be there. It's just not. I don't think that's correct. Uh, oh, so here's your chemogenetics. We just talked about that. Basically, it's the same idea. Uh, and the guys who developed the, the optogenetics, they originally tried doing it with magnets. They tried putting in like these little metal balls <laughs> into the receptors and then opening and closing them with magnets. It's kind of cool, I guess. But don't need to really worry about that. Hey, how about that? That didn't take too long. Are there questions about methods? No. Are you sure? <laughs>